We'll be combining the two scripture readings here from Philippians, where after praying for his Philippian friends, Paul describes his circumstance and how he sees it as bringing glory to God. Let us pray. Lord God, help us turn our hearts to you and hear what you will speak. For you speak peace to your people through Christ our Lord. Amen. from the first chapter of Philippians, verses 12 to 26. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole Imperial Guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now, as always, in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, living in Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. The word of the Lord. I know the spirit the spirit totally moved you and I loved that could you keep going (laughs) it was awesome these are the moments we live for right amen amen Amen. so good morning church (laughs) I'm really glad to be back here with you today Um, so I wanted you to know the title refined and rejoicing has a subtitle it's Paul Plato and the potter Each of you should have a small canister of Play-Doh that I will ask you to open shortly, but not now. Now, how many would like to confess that they've already opened it? (laughs) There is always one, right? (laughs) But I thought we'd have a little sensory fun with the message today. Um, And, but not yet. (laughs) Idle hands are the devil's workshop. So I've been told. So I thought, let's keep those hands busy. So some of you may have already cracked it open just to get a whiff of that Play-Doh smell. How many remember that, right? There's nothing like it. We were talking earlier, if you put on a blindfold and somebody put that under your nose, you would instantly say, (laughs) Play-Doh. But let's hold off for a moment and let's move to our scripture that comes from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. And in Acts 16, we see how the church in Philippi was born. It came into being in such a way that it is a small and diverse church that began with Paul and Silas when they visited there. There is Lydia, a wealthy woman. There's a former slave girl and a jailer with his family 
who are all at the heart of this story and the beginning of this church. It's a diverse group, and it's a beautiful expression and a beautiful illustration of the family of God. So the opening of Paul's letter to the church in Philippi begins as a thank you note with an update on how his life is going. He writes to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi. And then a few lines later, he goes on to say, I thank God every time I remember you. God's love for the people of Philippi, it's just a deep evidence of his love for Christ. And what stands out is that he prayed for them, even though he is imprisoned, and he is the one who needs the prayer. Paul tells us that all that has happened to him, being beaten, thrown in prison, and chained, has had a purpose. It is to advance the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. He writes of the whole palace guard and everyone else around him. It has become clear that he is in chains for Christ, not because of Christ, but for Christ, for his faith in Christ. It is estimated that the contingent of soldiers that Paul is in contact with numbers as several thousand. That is a lot of ripples in his sphere of influence pond. Paul states that because of his chains and his response to these people, other believers have grown bold and confident. Paul is modeling Christ as the suffering servant, and it's having an impact. Where in our lives are we responding to difficulties in a way that advances the gospel? Who's watching our response? And do we see our difficulties in that light as an opportunity to show others how to respond in Christ? Let's pray. Holy Lord, we thank you for this time and space where we can come together as your people to hear your word. Lord, let our hearts and minds be open and let our hands be busy. And may we hear what you have for us today clearly and then take that out into the world. Let my words be only your words. And we say this in your name, holiest of names, Lord Jesus. Amen. So believe it or not, there is a national Play-Doh Day. Of course, right? There's a national day for everything. But Play-Doh, it's in September, so we're a little early, but that's okay. I just want, if you want to Google that and mark it on your calendars and get ready. (laughs) Because who doesn't love a good can of Play-Doh? And I was thinking about Paul and his being refined. And then the song, The Potter's Hand, came into my mind. And then Play-Doh came to me. My mind is a strange and wonderful thing. (laughs) And then I'm thinking the Paul and the Potter and Plato. My, it just, how could we, how is God working in this? And I was stuck on the letter P that day. So let me remind you of the words to the song, The Potter's Hand. Beautiful Lord, wonderful Savior. I know for sure all of my days are held in your hands, crafted into your perfect plan. You gently call me into your presence, guiding me by your Holy Spirit. Teach me, dear Lord, to live all of my life through your eyes. I'm captured by your holy calling. Set me apart. I know you're drawing me to yourself. Lead me, Lord, I pray. Take me, mold me, Use me, fill me. 
I give my life to the potter's hand. I see Paul willing to be as clay, as Plato, so to speak, in the potter's hand, in the hands of Christ. Paul has given his life to Christ and trusts his Lord to be the Lord of his life in all aspects, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And he does it rejoicing. With that quiet confidence of God in his heart that emboldens him and strengthens him. Paul knows who he is, who made him, and where he is going. So as we move through our scripture, I now encourage you to open the can of Plato. And I want you to move it about in your hands. Feel what it is like to be a molder of clay. And I hope everyone got their favorite color. <laughs> but think of Paul, think on the word of God. Think about how and when you have been molded. And I encourage you to work the dough throughout the message. So let's break this down. Paul has written, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Give that Plato a squeeze. Paul loved preaching. It brought him joy. Think how you feel when you are doing something you love to do, when you are using a gift that God gave you, making music, right? being a nurse, working in ministry, raising a family, gardening. Paul has this strong sense of call. It brings him joy. He wrote in Romans, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God by the preaching of Christ. Paul outwardly preached to Lydia in Philippi, but the Lord inwardly opened her heart. Paul loves being the instrument that God uses. What was happening in this passage is that while Paul was in prison, some men who thought themselves as his rivals took advantage of the situation. Some people were preaching the good news out of love. Others had less than true motives. They wanted to grieve him. In other words, they wanted Paul to feel helpless and angry at being stuck in prison while they gained notoriety in his absence. They viewed Paul almost as an enemy to conquer and as someone to get the better of rather than a brother in need. They were preaching for this purpose of self-centered power and greed, selfish ambition, it still exists today. It's the human condition. But Paul, rather than lash out in anger and frustration to admonish these some, says something remarkable. Basically, don't get your knickers in a twist. <laughs> the gospel of Christ is being preached, and that is the only thing that matters. False hearts cannot drown out the true message. Paul's response to these selfish preachers is unexpected because in his letter to the church in Galatia, Paul is very clear how he feels about the false gospel that is being preached. And he vigorously, with love, corrects them. But the difference here is that the message of the gospel is being preached truly. It is the hearts of the preachers that are not true. The message is true. And our Reformed faith recognizes Paul's message here. 
In one of our confessions, which expresses our doctrine of theology, it states, the preaching of the word of God is the word of God. And goes on to say, it is the word itself is what is to be regarded, not the preacher. For even if he be evil and a sinner, nevertheless, the word of God remains still true and good. Praise be to God. In other words, the word of God cannot be corrupted. Think of someone in our world today who's a preacher of renown, or maybe even not that well known, but might be considered in it, so to speak, for themselves. Despite the issues of whatever it is, being too flashy or too much wealth or whatever it is, are they preaching the gospel? Are they advancing the kingdom? If we can answer yes, then Paul tells us to be glad and rejoice. In every time frame, there have been those who have gone into ministry for self-serving purposes or have worked against ministry. It is, again, part of that human condition, but our God is able to make something good come out of that. Whatever our ambitions, if we are sharing the true message of the gospel, God will be glorified. Take that to heart. Paul is being refined by his circumstances, and his attitude shows it. He's not putting his own ego and self-esteem first. He is not allowing his soul to be crushed by anger and disappointment. How's that Plato coming? What have we made so far? <laughs> Mountains, snakes, snowmen, a blob. <laughs> Christ. Oh, wow, we've got, all right. We're going to want to circle around her later. <laughs> So have you experienced anger and disappointment in your own life? Raise your hand if you have. Right? Give that Plato just an extra twist. Imagine yourself as the Plato. God is calling you into his presence, making you, molding you, shaping a perfect plan in you that takes into account those circumstances of disappointment or anger or whatever else, sorrow. God is working to, to refine you through your experiences. Paul shows us how to respond when we have this kind of difficulty. See where God is working in the circumstances and highlight that. Rejoice in that. Paul continues, Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So Paul continues to find a reason to rejoice despite his suffering and despite the mean actions of others. He's encouraged by prayers and finds strength in the Holy Spirit, written here as the Spirit of Jesus Christ. For the Spirit comes from both the Father and the Son. Paul knows he will be relieved of his suffering in one way or another. Either he will be released from prison or he will be executed. He has eager expectation. Now the Greek word for eager expectation, it's a little bit longer word, apokaradokia. You want to say that with me? Apokaradokia, right? It means to strain one's neck out to catch a glimpse of something ahead. Can you picture that kind of eagerness? Um, the waiting for a glimpse of the mailman, or should I say the Amazon driver, to... <laughs> to bring that eagerly anticipated package. Or waiting to catch a glimpse of a loved one as they come off a plane, because we can actually do that now. <laughs> so you're waiting for all, as people come off the plane and you're waiting and you're eagerly anticipating. Paul is full of that kind of anticipation, to see how God will work out this situation that he is in. And he realizes it will take courage to face what is coming, and to stick with his faith. 
And again, we can apply this to our current situations. Wherever we are finding it difficult to trust in God in our situations, to remember Paul, to think about being refined, squeeze your Play-Doh. How much easier would it be for Paul to renounce his faith and be released from prison? But he wants to stay the course and exalt Christ through the suffering of his physical body and the witness of his life. Being a follower of Jesus is not easy. And more and more, to say you are a Christian these days is met with skepticism or derision. But we stay the course because our faith makes us whole. Not because of our circumstances, but despite our circumstances. Again, give that Play-Doh a squeeze. Feel your hands molding the clay. God is molding Paul. God is molding us. And then comes Paul's dilemma. Okay, there's a little something right here that likes me a little too much. (laughs) This is my dilemma. (laughs) To swat him or not. (laughs) Does he hope for death? I'm sorry, that was Paul's, that's Paul's dilemma, sorry. (laughs) Or does he pray to stay in this world and let his life witness continue to glorify God? This is what Paul writes, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. For Paul, it is six of one, half a dozen of another, in a very difficult way. While he lives, Christ is the source that gives meaning to his life. That is his wellspring of continual joy. Everything is possible to endure because of Christ. On the other hand, if he were to die, he would actually be with Christ. Paul's greatest concern and the thing he most treasures is his relationship with Jesus. Wherever your heart is, there also is your treasure, says Jesus. Paul's heart is fully with Jesus. And this is even more remarkable when you consider that Paul was once Saul and a persecutor of Christians. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. God can use anyone at any time and anywhere, and there was always hope for redemption and reconciliation. And now Paul is between a true rock and a hard place. Which will glorify God more? And again, he is modeling the suffering servant because his concern is for the needs of his friends in Philippi ahead of his own. He knows death will bring a physical relief and a spiritual glory. Yet he waffles. If I live, I can still be effective for the gospel and bring more glory to Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I waffle about what to eat for dinner, or should I study now or take a nap? I'm kind of overwhelmed by Paul's faith in the things that he is waffling over. And I find myself thinking, how in this day and age can I be that kind of servant and have that kind of faith? How can we all? And then I realize that we have opportunities every day Maybe not life-threatening opportunities, but they're opportunities nonetheless. 
Each of us has situations and circumstances in our lives that bring choices or dilemmas. And our choices have the impact of bearing fruit for the kingdom. We too are being refined. Give your Plato a squeeze here. Are we putting the greater good of loving our neighbor before our own wants or needs? Are we thinking of the welfare of others when we make decisions or only ourselves? Are we willing to stay in a difficult situation or disagreement so that we may be ambassadors for Christ? Anytime a choice gives us an opportunity to love, to serve someone else besides ourselves, we have an opportunity to glorify God, to be as Paul. Paul never doubts that Jesus has a plan for him, and that plan will bring him closer to the God he loves. Death is not a defeat to the Christian, and Paul is fully aware of what is waiting for him. But he knows that at this point, it is far better to remain on this earth so he may assist in the progress of the faith of his friends, that they too may rejoice in their refinement. Paul is being molded like Plato and by the hands of the potter. So my questions for all of us are, how are we being refined? Are we able to rejoice in it? Do you believe, as Paul does, that you will bear fruit for the kingdom? That God will use you? That your words and actions and perhaps your life is a witness for Christ? This is a time when we need all hands on deck. As we come out of the pandemic, there are so many unanswered questions and confusion on how to proceed. Mask or no mask, vaccine or no vaccine, require, not require. Do we continue with change or go back exactly how we were? What needs to be burned away, refined? Like Paul, we can rejoice in the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our churches, in our society? Can we place our trust deeply and completely in the hands of God? Are you willing to be like Plato in the hands of Jesus Christ? Knowing that despite the difficulties, glorious fulfillment is coming. If it's a yes, then in your heart or aloud say these words, take me, mold me, I give my life to the potter's hands. And give a little squeeze to your Play-Doh to seal the deal. Amen?